Take your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11. As you remember, we've been, we're looking at the Hall of Fame of Faith, as they call it in Hebrews 11. And the writer of Hebrews goes through a lot of characters from the Old Testament because he wants to encourage the people that he's writing to to learn to live by faith. And beloved, that's what God wants you to do. He wants me to do the same thing, is to learn to live by faith, walk by faith, because we know the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So look at Hebrews 11. Look at verse 30. This is the next story we come to. In Hebrews 11:30. the writer refers to an Old Testament event in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Seven days. He points to uh, this story here in the Old Testament as an illustration of great things happening by faith. By faith. Now, again, why is he doing this? Well, faith is the only way you can please God. That's why he points out all these Old Testament stories. The writer is saying, listen, if you want to know how to live by faith, just look at some of these Old Testament characters. You're saved by faith. You walk by faith and you war by faith. And what we see here in the book of... uh, of Hebrews is uh, pointing to the Old Testament character Joshua as an example of how to overcome obstacles in our life. Now, let me ask you a question here today, and you don't have to raise your hand because I think we all all know the answer. How many of you have challenges in front of you? (laughs) How many of you have obstacles that you have to deal with? How many of you have strongholds, we could call uh, difficulties, that you need to overcome? And I want to tell you, dear friend, the only way you're going to overcome them is by faith, by faith. And this is what the writer is going to show us. So I, in order to really understand this verse, go back to the Old Testament. Look in Joshua chapter 5. Let's look at the story of how Joshua overcame this stronghold by faith in God. The book of Joshua chapter 5 is really where we get this story. And again, this is Joshua is looking at a stronghold. Look in chapter, actually chapter 6 verse 1 is where we'll start on this story where he's pointing to about Jericho, the writer is pointing to Jericho as this obstacle. Chapter 6, verse 1, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand Jericho and, and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And so the obstacle, the stronghold, and by the way, what is a stronghold? We know that that's a, that's a big fortress uh, that uh, is meant to be a, to, to defend. It's something that if you're going to conquer uh, a city, you have to overcome this stronghold. And uh, we know that strongholds were normally castles, fortresses, giant fortresses, and military battle and strength. Well, the stronghold that was in front of Joshua was the city of Jericho. Now, you remember that the reason that this was a stronghold for Jericho and the children of Israel is because God had given them the land, the promised land, the land of Canaan, but they had to claim it by faith. They had to systematically go through and conquer by faith. But God says, look, I've already given it to you. And by the way, you know, that's what victory is. Victory is simply claiming what God has already given us. Did you know that the moment you got saved and you received Jesus in your heart, at that moment you became victorious? You say, well, if I'm victorious, how come I don't feel victorious? If I'm victorious, how come I'm, I'm losing? Well, friend, you have to claim it. You see, the victory has been provided, but you have to claim it. Here, God said to Joshua, you see, I've already given this city into your hands. And what you have to do is you have to claim this, this stronghold. Uh, you have to claim the victory that I've already given you. And friend, that's so true in the Christian life. The, the stronghold for Joshua and Israel was that city Jericho. It was a formidable city. It was a strong city. In fact, let me tell you a few things about Jericho. Number one, Jericho was a sinful city. If you read anything about the Canaanites in that culture, they were people that worshipped idols. They were grossly immoral. They did incredibly evil things in the sight of God, which is why God was judging them with the children of Israel. This was a sinful city. You see, a, a stronghold Your Jericho might represent perhaps some besetting sin that you just can't seem to get victory over in your life. Uh, All of us are battling against sin, are we not, as Christians? We've been saved now, we've been justified, but now we're in this process of sanctification, which means we have to learn to overcome sin through the victory that the Lord has given us. So your Jericho might be a sin. Jericho was a sinful city, but also Jericho was a strong city. This was a military stronghold in the land of Canaan. 
It was the most formidable city in the land, very difficult to overcome. And friend, that's the way strongholds are. You might have a stronghold in your life, something that's so difficult. It might be a circumstance in your life that's just getting you down. It might be something so formidable that you just can't seem to get victory. That's your Jericho. It was a sinful city. It was a strong city, but also it was a strategic city. If Joshua and Israel could take this city, then the rest of the land of Canaan would be open and he would have access to the rest of the land. If you read the book of Joshua, basically he had three military campaigns. Enter to the central land. He had to conquer Jericho and then Ai and then Bethel and then Shiloh. And then he had a southern campaign where he would go south and he would conquer Gibeon and and uh, Lachish, and Hebron, and Jerusalem. And then he had a northern campaign where he would conquer the, the city of Hazor, and then Kadesh. And then once Joshua basically cleared out the military strongholds, it was rest the, uh, left up to the children of Israel to kind of do the mopping up operation. But the very first city to stand in the way was Jericho. Again, I want to ask you, what is your Jericho today? What is the stronghold that has to come down in order for you to fully claim the victory that you have in Christ. Well, friend, I want you to see in this passage three principles that will tear down that stronghold, and you can learn to overcome by faith. If you're taking notes, here's the first one. Number one, consider it with Christ. You have a stronghold. You have something in your life you need to get victory over. Consider it with Christ. Look, look, Look back in chapter 5. Look at verse 13. Notice what happens in the story. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua uh, went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? You see, we have to look at the strongholds in our life through the eyes of our captain. This is exactly what Joshua does. Now, Joshua and the children of Israel had just crossed the the Jordan River. They now had to start to claim uh, their Canaan. They knew, logically, I think Joshua knew that the It made sense that the next city they had to deal with was right in front of them. It was Jericho. Now, God, at that point, had not yet given any divine instruction to Joshua. But it seemed reasonable that Jericho was the next place to conquer. And so he does what a military uh, commander would do. You know, this is veterans today. We're kind of honoring soldiers today, aren't we? Well, Joshua was a great soldier. And he went out that night on a kind of reconnaissance mission. He wanted to look over that city. He wanted to see what he was dealing with. And you can just imagine what's going on in his mind. Here is before him is this massive city, this stronghold. And Joshua had had military battles before, but nothing like this. I mean, this was a city that had huge walls. Uh, The children of Israel, they had no siege engines. They had no battering rams. They weren't uh, experienced in uh, siege warfare. They had nothing like this. This was beyond them. This is beyond anything they could do. The only weapons they had were uh, sling stones and arrows and spears, which were nothing against the walls of Jericho. And furthermore, Joshua knew that the battle must be won. He couldn't bypass Jericho. He couldn't say, well, you know what? This is too much for us now. Let's just forget it and we'll go on somewhere else that's easier. No, you can't. he couldn't do that because if he left this city unconquered, that meant the enemy would have the rear all the time and they'd have to be looking over their shoulder. So he said, no, this, this city has to come down. And by the way, my friend, let me just tell you this. That stronghold in your life, you can't ignore it. you got to face it. You can't bypass it. You can't say, I'll take care of it later. It has to come down. It has to come down now. And so don't wait. So Joshua is pondering all these things. And suddenly that night while he's out there on this reconnaissance mission, he senses the presence of someone else. In verse 13, we saw it. It says, he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, art thou for us or for our adversaries? Now, he did what any good soldier would do. If you see someone, he went over and said, you know, halt, who goes there? Who are you? Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? 
And the response in verse 14, he said, nay, but as captain of the Lord of hosts. In other words, the response was, uh, I'm not for you. Uh, I'm not here to uh, choose sides. I'm here to take over. The question is not, am I for you? But the question is, are you for me? You see, the question is not, are, are, are you on the, uh, or is the Lord on your side? The question is, are you on his side? And this is what God was saying to Joshua. And by the way, Joshua knew immediately that this wasn't just any soldier, that this was the Lord himself. This is what we call in theology a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. This is when Jesus appears in the Old Testament. And Joshua knows instinctively in verse 14, it says, And he fell on his face to the earth and did what? Worship. You don't worship another man. You don't worship just an angel. You only worship God. And so Joshua knows that this is the Lord. And so here's the Lord with him. May I tell you something, dear friend, that in the battle that you're facing, God does not leave you alone. He's not going to let you go at it alone. He is there with you. His presence is there with you. And this is what Joshua is considering. Consider his presence in the battle. The Lord is with him. Now, Joshua doesn't recognize him at first, but he does now. And his response is worship. And then he, look what he says in verse 15. In verse 15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And he did. And this is what Moses, uh, God said to Moses at the burning bush. Now, what did this do for Joshua? Again, it gave him assurance that the, this battle is not his alone. This is the Lord's battle. And I want to tell you something, dear friend. If you're saved and you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you have a Jericho in front of you, just realize that you're not alone in that battle. This, the Lord is with you. We could, we could say the battle is the Lord's. And that's what the Lord was there to t remind Joshua about. Look, this isn't your fight. This is my fight. You don't have to worry about a military strategy. I already have it. All you have to do is just obey. And the same is true for whatever stronghold you have in your life. You don't have to come up with some complex strategy. You just have to trust God. You just have to exercise faith in God. No matter what stronghold you're dealing with you are not alone you have a captain and the first thing you should do is worship your captain if you want to overcome that stronghold so consider his presence but also consider his promise look in chapter six again and look down in verse number two and the lord said unto joshua see i have given into thy hand jericho notice that i have given that is victory is assured this is already won it's already been given to you and again, this is the principle of the Christian life. In Christ, you are already victorious. Victory is not your destination. It is your point of origin. You start out victorious because of what Christ did. Did you realize that on the cross, Jesus completely defeated Satan for you? Do you realize that? He completely, listen, he, he defeated Satan, sin, and death on the cross. He's already won the battle. And we have to realize that. Consider his promise, but then consider his plan for the battle. Look in verse 3, on down to verse 7. God had a plan for Joshua to follow. Look in verse 3. And he said, Ye shall come past the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shall ye do six days. And the seven priests shall bear before the ark uh, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall come past the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. Verse 5, it shall come to pass when they shall make a long blast with a ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now, this was the plan. Now, notice here, Joshua didn't submit a plan to the Lord and say, here, God, I want you to bless this plan. I don't see that in the story. Joshua could have said, now, now, Lord, I already have a plan on how we can take this over. I just want you to approve this plan. That's sometimes what we do with God. God, I already have a plan. I've already got to figure it out. I just need you to approve this. And again, you're not the one calling the shots. The captain is, right? And as J, uh, J. Hudson Taylor was teaching some missionaries, and he said this. He said, there are three ways to do God's work. He said, number one, you can make the best plans we can and then hope they succeed. He said, number two, he said, you can make your own plans and ask God to bless them. Or he said, number three, you can ask God for his plan 
and then do what he says do. And he said, I suggest you do the third because it's a whole lot easier. And victory is assured. And friend, the same is true in the Christian life. Again, you don't have to come up with a strategy. God's already got the battle plan. He has it right here. All you have to do is obey. And so God gave him the plan. Now, this was perhaps the most unique battle plan, if you want to call it that, in all of military history. But this is what God said do. He said, look, I want you to get, the, get your army together. I want you to walk around the city uh, one, one time for seven days. And on the, seventh, on the last day, you walk around it seven times. This was the battle. Now, that doesn't sound rational. I can imagine Joshua pro- maybe in his mind thinking, well, okay, Lord. But this doesn't sound like a really great military strategy here. In fact, if any army tried this plan, it probably wouldn't work today. So why was God doing this? These orders, you know, and by the way, sometimes God will ask us and command us to do things that might not seem like it's rational or logical to us. But you know what? Man's ways are not God's ways. And the wisdom of God is higher than man. And sometimes God will, God's orders are designed to test our faith. I think maybe God is testing the faith of Joshua and Israel. Do you trust me? Do you trust me to win this victory for you? That's the question. And friend, I want to pose that question to you. You have this stronghold. You have this difficulty in front of you. Do you trust God to take care of it for you? That's the question. God's orders are designed to test our faith. Hebrews 11.30 says, by faith. The walls of Jericho came down, not by military power, not by military strategy, not by Joshua's brilliance. It's by faith, faith, not in the wisdom of men, but faith in the power of God. God's orders are sometimes designed to test our faith, but also God's orders are designed to test our patience. That city didn't fall overnight. They had to walk around that city every day. You ever been over in Israel? It's hot. You know, you can imagine just marching around that city. You know, I imagine they're in their armor. They're probably sweating. They didn't have under armor back then. They're just walking around that city sweating. Probably one talking to another like, why are we doing this? I don't know. This is what Joshua said. Do he said he got these orders from God. What are we going to do tomorrow? We're going to walk around again. What are we going to do the next? We're going to walk around again. We're going to do it for seven days. And that's what they did. You know, sometimes. Uh. We just have to trust God and be patient. Just be patient. I know you say, well, I'm praying about something. It hasn't happened yet. Well, friend, just keep praying. Just wait on the Lord. God has his own time. And so God's orders are designed to test our patience. God's orders are designed to test our self-control. God said, when you walk around, be quiet, be silent. You ever tried not talking for a whole day? Anybody here? That's not the easiest thing to do. Just be silent takes a lot of self-control just not to say anything. And I think while they're marching around the walls, you can imagine the enemy taunting them from the top of the walls. But they still had to be quiet. Don't say anything. You know, there's just a time to just be still and know that he's God and not answer back and just be silent. God's orders are designed to test our obedience. Again, I think this was a test to see if they would obey the Lord. You don't always need to understand everything. You just need to obey God. Just obey what he says. General George Patton had a funny way of finding a a soldier that he would promote to a leadership position. This is what he'd do. He'd get his candidates together and he'd say, man, I want you to dig a trench eight feet long, three feet wide, six inches deep. And then he would leave them and then he would he would he would it was behind a warehouse and he would go in the warehouse and listen through a window at their response after he was gone. And he would he could overhear what they would say. Always there'd be soldiers like, why does he want a a trench right here in the middle of nowhere? And another soldier would say, this doesn't make any sense. But always there is one soldier that would say, what difference does it make? Let's just obey the order. And always that was the one that Patton would would promote to the next position. You know why? Because he knew that if you were going to be a good leader, you you needed to learn how to follow orders. And I want to tell you something, friend, as a Christian, if you want to be used of God, You just have to learn how to follow God's orders. You don't need to learn every reason why. Just do it. So number one, 
You say, I've got a stronghold. Well, consider it with Christ. You can't bypass it. You can't forget it. You can't say, I'll take care of it later. You have to face it. But when you look at it, remember, consider his presence. Consider his promise. Consider his plan as you face that stronghold. So number one, consider it with Christ. But here's number two, circle it with prayer. Circle it with prayer. Look down in verse number six. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests, said unto them, take up the Ark of the Covenant, And let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, pass on and come past the city and let him that is armed pass before the ark of the Lord. You say, what's going on here? Well, you have to admire Joshua. He doesn't hesitate. You know what he does? Immediate obedience. He just immediately obeys. Joshua orders them to line up in formation just as God had prescribed. He tells them, be silent. He says, let the priests blow the trumpets. There's no ladders. There's no catapults. There's no battering rams. Again, even if they had them, they wouldn't know how to use them. They'd never done siege warfare in their life. Even if they had all of that. But the truth of the matter is, all of that was unnecessary because it was the Lord that was going to bring down those walls, not Joshua and the army. Now, I've got to be honest with you. For many years, I'd read this passage, and it would baffle me. I would read it, and I thought, it just doesn't make any sense. And, uh, you know, if you again, if you try this in any battle today, you're going to lose. And then it dawned on me one day, you know, I'm kind of a slow learner. I'm not the sharpest tool in the woodshed. And it took me a while to figure this out. But you know what? This is not a military strategy that's, that God's commanding here. You know what this is? This is a dedication service. It's a dedication service. God's not asking them to fight. What he's doing is he's asking them to give it over to him, to dedicate this city to him, to let God take care of it. That's what's going on here. That's why the silence. You see, this was a solemn dedication service. And I want to tell you again, friend, there are times when we're dealing with strongholds in our life. We just need to be quiet and be still and know that he's God. And give it to God in prayer. Just say, Lord, I'm giving this this difficulty, this circumstance, this person. I'm giving them to you, Lord. And and I'm going to be still and know that you're God. That's why the trumpets. The trumpets were used in the Old Testament to announce a solemn worship service. That's why you have the trumpets here. That's why you see the number seven. Did you know that the number seven is God's number according to the Bible? Uh, On the seventh day, God rested, which means God completed his work. We see seven days of creation. We see it in creation. We see it in the consummation. You look in the book of Revelation, there's seven all over the place. Seven uh, seals, seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven thunders. Why? It all signifies one thing. It all signifies the work of God. This is what God is going to do. And their actions, in a sense, was... Really, it was it was it was this. It was they were saying by going around the city and then on the last day, seven times they were saying, Lord, it is yours. We give this whole city over to you. Lord, you take care of it. That's exactly what they were doing. Some of you in history know that in 1961, the Soviets constructed a wall right down the middle of Germany. And that that became East and West Germany, that massive wall. Uh, became a kind of a symbol of what between a free world and a world that was under communist reign. And of course, some of you might remember when Ronald Reagan in 1987 did a speech right before that wall. Remember what he said, the famous words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You know, those are words that ring throughout history now. And there's a sense in which when Joshua and the men of Israel were marching around Jericho, they were saying to the Lord, Lord, you tear down this wall. Lord, you take care of this stronghold. We must give it to the Lord in prayer. Now, again, there's some people here. You have a problem. You might be saying, I've done everything I could to handle this problem. I know. And it's time now just to give it to God. Give it over to the Lord. You say it might be a person. You might have a wayward child. And you might say, I've done all I could. I've taught them right. I've, I've taught them the scripture. I have done everything I know to do. I don't know what else to do. Well, here's the last thing to do. Just give them to the Lord. 
Give them to the Lord. Next time they, walk, they come into your house, just walk around them seven times. So I'm giving you to God. You're not my problem anymore. You dedicate them to the Lord. Say, God, this is all yours. I don't know what else to do. Humanly speaking, I'm weak. There's nothing I can do. But, Lord, you can do all things. And that's what Joshua and Israel knew, that the Lord could do this. So circle it with prayer. Consider it with Christ. Circle it with prayer. And then here's the last thing. Claim it by faith. Claim it by faith. Look at verse number 20 in chapter 6. Because this is what happens. Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout. And watch this. That the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him and they took the city. This is so interesting. I love the way this is worded because you know what archaeology found? And by the way, I've been to this very Jericho. I've seen it with my own eyes. Some of the ruins of this city that when the walls crumbled, it was kind of set on a hill and the walls crumbled down flat. And you know what it made? It made just a natural ramp. All the rubble just crumbled down, made an easy ramp. And so they just went up into the city. That's exactly what the Bible says happened here. But they did it after the shout. Now, you know what this shout is? The word for shout here is actually a word that's used also in uh, the Psalms for many times. when it's a word that's really used for praise, for praise. And in a sense, you know what they were doing? They were praising God for the victory in advance. That was the shout. I wasn't there, but I suspect the shout was probably... Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because they knew the victory had already come. And you know, friend, that's the shout of faith. You know what you need to do? You say, I got a stronghold. Okay. Then praise God in advance for what he's going to do. Claim it by faith. Lord, I know you're going to take care of this for me. So, Lord, I give it to you. And you claim it by faith. Are you willing to do that? To claim it by faith? You know... Paul was having trouble with the city of Corinth. They were acting so bad that they actually discouraged him. And at one point, if you read in 2 Corinthians, Paul is despondent. The, the Bible says there was a door of, op- of utterance open, but Paul said, I was so despondent that I couldn't, I couldn't open, I couldn't go through that door. I couldn't preach. I was so depressed. He was so depressed over the, the church of Corinth for what they were doing and the way they were treating him. And finally, word came to him of Titus that God had answered all of Paul's prayers. And then Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory. Paul, he had a stronghold. He gave it to the Lord. He waited. He prayed. And you know what? God brought it down. And then later Paul would write this, for the weapons of our warfare, listen to this, are not carnal. In other words, they're not physical weapons, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, you know what our weapons are? Our weapons are prayer, the word of God, faith in what God says. Faith in what God says. And that's how we win those battles. And so consider your stronghold with Christ. Circle it with prayer. Claim it by faith. Now, let me close with this story here. In 1944, you know that was World War II, And uh, there was a sub-lieutenant named Hiro Onoda of the Imperial Japanese Army. He was ordered to stay, um, actually I should say a sub-lieutenant, Onoda from the Imperial Japanese Army. He was ordered to stay on an island called Lubang Island in the Philippines. And he was ordered to, to hold that island for the glory of the emperor. That was his last orders. And you know what? He took those orders literally. He held it. The following year, the Allies bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the Japanese surrendered. Shortly after that, as you know, according to history, the war ended. But you know what? He didn't know that. And he kept on fighting. The year after that and the next year, he continued to fight. He was still fighting in that island for 29 years after World War II had ended. He was totally unaware that the war had finished long ago. Even when the police searched 
through that jungle using megaphones, asking him to surrender. He refused to surrender. Sometimes he would shoot at locals, thinking they were the enemy. It wasn't until 1974 when they brought in his wartime commander. And his wartime commander called him through a bullhorn. He came out of the jungle. He snapped at attention. He saluted his commander. And he finally said to him, the war is over. The war is over. And finally, he surrendered at that point. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Let me tell you something, friend. Do you know what? Uh, do you know that for uh, Satan, he's already been defeated? Uh, he's already been defeated. But you know what? He keeps on fighting. And he's going to keep on fighting you until the commander, the Lord Jesus, tells him, stop. Stop fighting. And so, friend, I want to tell you that the only way to overcome your stronghold, the only way to defeat Satan in your life is to get your commanding officer, the captain of your salvation, on your side and listen to him. And when you depend upon your captain, then you're going to have victory. So the question really is today, have you applied the victory that your captain has already given you? He's already given you victory. That's where the faith comes in. You say, I don't see it. That's where faith comes in. It tells us we already have it. Whatever you're dealing with in your life, claim that victory of the cross. Claim the victory of Christ. And then, friend, just wait on the Lord and let God bring you that victory. Let's bow for prayer together today. Father, I am so grateful that you've already won the fight for us. And all we have to do is claim it. The victory is already ours. So many times, Lord, the thing that defeats us is our own ignorance, not realizing these things. And we, I know, Lord, the devil would just as soon that we not remember that we already have that victory. So, Lord, remind us today that by faith, we can face our stronghold and we can bring it down by faith. We know our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God. And so, Lord, I pray that this will encourage the hearts of your people. Many here today are facing monumental challenges in their life, monumental strongholds. Lord, help them to exercise faith in you and to trust you for victory. With heads bowed and eyes closed, how many say that's my prayer today? I have a stronghold that's got to come down. It's got to come down. And I'm trusting Jesus to do it. I'm trusting the Lord. I see hands all over. God bless you, friend. God bless you. Put your faith in the mighty power of your captain. God bless you. God bless you, friend. Let me ask you this. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you to do that today, friend. Don't leave here without knowing that Jesus has forgiven you for all of your sins and you have a home in heaven. That's what the gospel is all about. We want you to know Christ. We want you to know that you're going to heaven. Jesus, our captain, has won for us the victory so that we can have eternal life. He's, he's given us victory over sin, Satan, and death. And that victory is only yours, friend, if you come to know Christ. If you, if you receive him as your Lord and Savior, would you be willing to do that today? How many say, that's my prayer. Today, I'm putting my faith in Jesus to be the captain of my salvation. Would you pray for me, preacher? Anyone here, I'm looking around just for a moment. I don't want to embarrass you. But if that's your prayer, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you, beloved? Anyone here and say, no, I, I just, I'm not saved, but I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know Jesus. All right. Father, bless these words to every hearing heart. Thank you again, Lord, for the wonderful victory we have in Christ. In Jesus' name.